Our last speaker for the evening is Dr. Robert Metcalf, who is the Professor of Innovation and Murchison Fellow of Free Enterprise here at the Cockrell School of Engineering. Dr. Metcalf was an internet pioneer at MIT starting in 1970. In 1973, he received his PhD from Harvard for a packet communication. And during that same year, he invented Ethernet. In 1979, he founded 3Com Corporation, which is now part of HP. Dr. Metcalf has received numerous industry awards and, re and recognitions, including the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1996, the National Medal of Technology in 2005, and the Fellow Award from the Computer History Museum in 2008. In 2007, he was inducted laser. into the National Inventors Hall of Fame as, result, as a result of his work and career. In November 2010, Dr. Metcalf was selected to lead innovation initiatives here at UT at the Cockrell School. He began his appointment in January 2011. It is our true honor having him here today with us, and please help us in welcoming him, Dr. Metcalf. I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur, and I'm honored to be with fellow engineers. I, I assume you're all engineers. <laughs> if there are any non-engineers here, could you just please leave? <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to tell a story uh, that also does not end with uh, the cure of cancer, uh, but it's a 45-year story, and um, uh, I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> so this is the uh, Internet in 1973. The Internet began operation, it was called the ARPANET, in October of 1969. This is four years later. Uh, there's several interesting things to note about this. MIT is on uh, the ARPANET and I did that, and Xerox is on the ARPANET, and I did that. And uh, those lines are the big transcontinental trunks that carried all internet traffic, and they ran at uh, 50 kilobits per second. <laughs> you will notice that the, this main southern trunk goes directly across Texas without stopping. There, anyway, uh, the other point to make is, each of those uh, dots is a computer, not a city, not even a building, an entire computer. So that's how many computers there were on the internet. Uh, and th this is a picture of a grad student at the time, me. <laughs> and uh, I w several things to point out. So this is um, in 19 roughly 73. In the upper right-hand corner of the shelf is a box of carousel slides, 35 millimeter slides. To illustrate, this is prior to PowerPoint. PowerPoint was uh, 15 years later. Uh, over here, you have what's called a telephone. <laughs> and it has a wire that goes into the wall, oddly. <laughs> Above that, you see what's called a Rolodex, which is how we kept uh, addresses in those days. And um, these are called pencils over here. <laughs> And uh, speaking of bandwidth, over there is a, a Texas Instrument Silent 700. That is the state-of-the-art uh, computer terminal of the day. And the bandwidth coming into my office to service that terminal was 300 baud, or 300 bits per second. That's how we um, computed. So at the Xerox Research Center, uh, we decided in 1973 to build arguably the first personal computer, and this is a picture of it called the Alto. You'll notice it has a bitmap display, it has a mouse, it has removable media. Each of those pizzas is a two megabyte, two megabyte, <laughs> megabyte <laughs> disk, and this is the personal computer which just fit under the desk, and what you cannot see is its connection to the network because it hadn't been invented yet. So I, this is a, uh, I'm a very lucky person. I was given the job of networking those computers together in the building because we were going to put one of them, I know this is hard to believe, a personal computer on every desk. And this, had, this situation had never occurred before in the history of the world, and I got to build the network to connect them together. And it was called on May 22nd, 1973, the Ethernet. So this is a drawing from that memo in 73. Now, today about a billion new Ethernet connections are shipped every year, 1.2 billion. And that's if you count Wi-Fi, which of course I do. 
<laughs> and, uh, and if there's any doubt, what does that say? What does that say over there? Radio ether. That's Wi-Fi is in the diagram. So I get to take credit for Wi-Fi. <laughs> So I spent, spent the next eight years building this Ethernet network, an internet of, of Ethernets inside of Xerox Corporation, and then in 1979 left Xerox to uh, start a company to do this for the rest of the world, 3Com Corporation. And uh, my good fortune was in, in August of 1981, IBM introduced its personal computer. The first, uh, Apple was 76, this was IBM in 81, but this is when it really all happened. And at my little company, we built that printed circuit card, called it the Etherlink, the world's first Ethernet for a personal computer. We sold it for about $1,000. This is before Ethernet was built into every computer. You had to add it. It was so Ethernet was a peripheral. This was the card. You'll notice on the right here, there's a, a, a DB connector about midway up, and that's for going off the board up into the ceiling where you might have a 10 megabit per second modem or you could just to the lower right here connect directly to the coax to put your PC, your IBM PC, on an Ethernet. So my company started selling these and we sold uh, our sales force, which had six people at the time, were all mini computer salespeople and they were used to selling $30,000 things. And how much is that? 1,000. So the commission on this was way lower than the commission on a mini computer. So my salesmen all wanted to sell 30 at a time so they could get back up to 30,000. The trouble was when you're selling a network card that you plug into personal computers to network them, it's a problem if none of your customers have personal computers. So we had to look high and low and we generally found people with fewer than 30 personal computers so we came up, and now I'm getting into the topic of my talk, we came up with a, a, um, a way to lower the cost of trial by selling a three-node network we, and, uh, for $3,000, and it included software for sharing a printer, sharing a disk, and exchanging electronic mail among the attached computers. And this was palatable, and people started buying it. Uh, and then we went back a few months later and said, hey, did you like that? Would you like to buy more? And our customers said, no. <laughs> this does exactly what you said it would do. It would, sh it would share our expensive printer. Laser printer in those days cost $7,000. And you can also share a disk. There was this, IBM came out with this huge disk. No one knew what to do with it. It was 10 megabytes. 10, have I, have I mentioned megabytes? <laughs> But in those days, that was more uh, bytes than anyone knew what to do with. So the idea of sharing them among a network of PCs was quite important. The trouble was that these three node networks were not useful, which presented a problem for my little company because we needed to sell more and uh, we were having trouble. So I went into a trance as head of sales and marketing and came up with this diagram. This is the actual diagram. It's a slide. When I say it's a slide, I mean it's a 35 millimeter slide. If I mentioned that PowerPoint did not, a, I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. This is 1980, so PowerPoint wasn't here yet. So I gave this slide to my sales force, and we went back out to those people who had bought three node networks, and we made the following high concept argument. The reason that your network is not useful is that it's not big enough. So therefore, you need to buy more of our <laughs> products. And this wasn't entirely um, uh, a lie. Because I had worked at the Xerox Research Center, have I mentioned, and we filled Xerox with ethernets and PCs and, and a big internet, and that network was damn useful. So I knew these networks had to be useful. I just had to explain why these little ones weren't. And here comes the topic. This diagram argued that the, the cost of the network is linear in the number of nodes that you buy. But the value of the network is based on the number of connections that you can make with that network. And the number of such connections is each node can connect to n minus 1 other nodes so the value was n times n minus 1, or approximately n squared. So that's the quadratic, going like this. Can I use the word quadratic? 
So there's the quadratic. And what happens to the quadratic? It eventually passes the linear, so you have that critical mass point. So we argued that the three node networks were below critical mass, and the goal was to get your network above critical mass. Fifteen years later, that slide was called by someone else, not me, Metcalfe's Law. That is, the idea that a network grows in value as the square of the number of its participants. Now, mine was not the only effort to quantify what has become known as the network effect. The network effect is this recurring and very important phenomena where you build a network, say, like Google or Facebook, that it suddenly becomes very valuable and blossoms in value into, in the case of Google, hundreds of billions of dollars. So there were various attempts to do the network effect. David Sarnoff was famous for Sarnoff's law, and he said the value of a network grows as the number of people connected. Of course, he was selling television networks. What's that, five minutes? Okay, I'm gonna hurry. Uh, Metcalf's law said it goes as the square, and then our friend David Reed was uh, very ambitious. He said the value of a network is the number of possible groups you can form, which is two to the n, uh, which is way big. And then, uh, more recently, a Professor Alisco, University of Minnesota, said that Metcalf's law was dangerous <laughs> and that networks only grow in value as n log n, which is less than n squared. So the real trouble was people began to believe that n squared was just too big because the value would just grow uh, beyond bound. And by the way, Alisco didn't fix that because, as you know, n log n also grows without bound. So the, the IEEE computer magazine asked me last summer to revisit my law in light of 40 years of Ethernet and in light of the fact that it was this problem that everyone was complaining of. Oh, by the way, it was dangerous. Adlisco claimed Metcalfe's law was dangerous because it inflated the Internet bubble in the year 2000 and caused this big overinflation because everyone thought the networks were going to grow with value n squared, and it turns out they I guess they didn't, and so the bubble crashed, and it's all my fault. <laughs> Alisco claimed this on the cover of IEEE Spectrum magazine. Anyway, this summer, last summer, they asked me and a bunch of other people to visit our various laws, and so I went back to visit. Now, being a stubborn person, I decided that I was not going to cave and revise my law. So I will die believing that the value of a network grows as the square of the numbers. But I had to address the objections. So what if n of t, what if n were somehow limited? Could that fix the bug in this thinking? Are you with me? Yeah. Don't change my law. Look at n. So I found, I went shopping for a function. <laughs> And there it was on the web. It has its own Wikipedia page. It's called the sigmoid. And the sigmoid function is cool. It's an S-curve, meaning imagine you have some population. You begin by uh, winning adoptions, and eventually it flattens out. And the really nice thing about this law is that the derivative, there are many S-curves, but this particular S-curve has the feature that the derivative is proportional to the number of uh, members of the network times the numbers of people or devices that have yet to join the network. And so it has a derivative which peaks at about 50-50. So in the beginning, your network goes faster and faster as it gets bigger, but pretty soon you run out of people to connect, and so the derivative starts heading back down again. So I took, I took a MOOC course. I took Introduction to Computer Science and Computer Programming from MIT uh, as a MOOC, 600X, and learned how to program in um, Python. So I took this function, the sigmoid, and generalized it. That is, I gave it three parameters. So you could say, when would this adoption happen? How fast would it ad uh, happen? And to what population would it happen? Are you with me? So just generalize it a little. I have three parameters now. When, how fast, and how big this adoption curve will be. And then I took the growth numbers from Facebook. So the, the red dots 
are the uh, 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 monthly average users of Facebook from um, inception until December 31st of last year. And then I took the revenue associated with that, which are the green dots since inception till 1231. I got um, Facebook to tell me the actual answers. And then I took Python and this function, and I, and I attached three sliders to each of the parameters on the Netoid function. And I looked at the dots, and I fiddled with the sliders until I achieved a fit. <laughs> so the first fit was kind of easy to achieve because uh, you have a function with three parameters, you can fit almost anything. So I got that fit, but then I fit, uh, take revenue of Facebook as a surrogate for value, and then apply Metcalf's law to the number of users of that network, N of T, and look at how, what a great fit I got on revenue. I rest my case. <laughs> Uh, one thing to notice is this fit of monthly average users, where if you go out to infinity, it goes to about 2.5 billion, which happens to be, the, by coincidence, the current number of users of the Internet. So that's what you'd expect, that Facebook can't grow bigger than the Internet. Uh, uh, and that then raised the question, how many friends can you have? It turns out there's a sociologist who studied this for decades, Mr. D uh, Professor Dunbar. And after many years, he decided, he dis discovered that the human brain has the capacity, cognitive capacity, to have about 150 friends. There's a little variability, but it, around 150. So I called up Facebook, and I said, how many users you got? 1.06 billion. How many friend connections do you have? 150 billion. So then I did what? What did I do next? A division. I divided the number of users into the number of friends connection, and the answer is 141, which is really close to 150. An, an amazing output. Uh, but incidentally, there's something wrong with that. Of course, that's the average of number of friends. So some people have many more friends than that, and, and I have three. Uh, and you would think that with the tools that Facebook provides that you should be able to sustain more friends than unaided. So I, I leave, that's an open, open question, how many friends can you have now that you have Facebook? So this, it, this network effect, if you're interested as an engineer in, or as an entrepreneur in building a network product, you really want to tap into the network effect. You can tap into the Sarnoff value by just having users that you send information to. You can tap into the sharing economics, let's say by sharing a printer or a disk, which are better, but linear in the number of users. Or you can tap into the network effect by getting your users talking to each other, in which case you can get n squared growth. So the goal is to get a network effect into your, um, uh, the design of whatever your products are. The real problem, of course, is when you start. When you start, you have one user. And there's no network effect in that. So the real problem, the reason not uh, everybody founds Facebook, is that it's hard to get from one over critical mass. Of course, once you get over critical mass, then it's uh, sky's the limit. So I'd like to end by reaffirming that the value of a network grows as the square of the number of users. And uh, thank you very much.